For thousands of years, people have studied lineages and diligently recorded ancestries. Cattle breeds began in much the same way. A successful line of cattle carried on through generations. The lines of Angus cattle and the lineages of man, their histories are intertwined. From the breed's origin in Scotland to Dutch immigrants in North Carolina, Cajuns in the Louisiana Bayou, to the spiritual descendants of European monks in the hills of Arkansas. From Greek immigrants in the Rocky Mountains, to a Mexican immigrant family in the desert of Nevada, and to a native people of the Great Plains. The central thread to these seemingly unconnected families is the lineage of Angus cattle. And those cattle, like the families who raised them, come from somewhere. The line began and has continued unbroken for centuries in the north of Scotland at Ballandalic Castle, the oldest Angus herd in the world. It was my great-grandfather who started the first Aberdeen Angus herd with two other great agriculturists, Watson of Keeler and McCombie, and uh, my great-grandfather. And it was they who bred the Aberdeen Angus uh, together. And uh, they produced the first pedigree Aberdeen Angus in 1860. We obviously have quite a lot of records going back late 1850s, early 1860s and you've had the work of Watson and Macombie. Credit where credit's due, they had done a lot of the initial uh, codifying of the breed, I guess. Sir George Macpherson Grant took the breed and really went out and promoted it showed um, various exhibitions globally, most important of which was the Paris show. Um, I think it was 1870, I'm not absolutely certain, but he did a lot of showing and uh, probably, as they say now, making a brand out of the Aberdeen Angus. So Sir George Macpherson Grant, my great-great-grandfather, can be applauded for both making the right choice of breed, but also then uh, taking the breed global. Australia, New Zealand, South America, America, Canada, and it all started from this little area in Scotland. Ballandalic was built in 1546, and it's been added on to, of course, in other times, as they always did. And my family have been there, there since I think for me one of the challenges is to work out where we go in the future. Many businesses are, is a question of, well, well what do you want to do? You know, many options are open. Here we have those decades, generations of responsibility to keep the Angus going. My mother has a fine eye for cattle and she worked with David to, to make, make the decisions on the farm as to what we keep, what we don't keep uh, and where we want to go. The Angus cattle are the love of my life. Uh, I've been at Bandalic, as I said, since I was five years old, and since then they've always been out all summer in the Kuhoch, or the cow's meadow. Um, and I used to go and talk to them most days. Uh, so I have a huge interest in the cattle. We had a wonderful cattleman for 48 years. Then there was a sort of moment that we didn't have uh, such good cattle. David Johnson came into our lives and his family and since then we have gone right up. Of course David Johnson has a wonderful eye uh, for cattle and he has made the Bandala herd over the last eight years.
Uh, well, welcome, welcome to Ballandala. Um, it's uh, a lovely setting in the, in the heart of Speyside here. Um, we've, um, we like to think we've got a nice, a nice Angus herd, and it's a, it's, a, it's a great privilege actually to to be in charge of the the oldest Aberdeen Angus herd in the world and continuous existence. Why Angus? Oh well, the, um, I've, I've worked with two different herds of, of Aberdeen Angus cattle before. I worked with the Fairoaks herd in Inverness and the Cardona herd in, in, in Stirling. And um, I've always found them very easy to work with. Um, quite cattle, uh, very, very easy fleshed, easy calving, um, which means a lot nowadays. There's not the same stuff about, so uh, the easier the cattle are to work with. We try and keep our cattle not too big an animal. Um, we're sort of very conscious of what an Aberdeen is set out to be. Um, we're like a, an animal that's grass fed, easy finished, easy fleshed, uh, easy calved. Uh, so one of the main things that we try and keep a lot of attention to is the head of the animal. Um, yeah. Like a nice Angus head. And we normally think if you get the head right, the rest of the animal will follow. Um, not everybody agrees with that. A lot of folks say the head ends up on the slaughterhouse floor, but to us as a breeder, it's breed character. It is, it is a great honour. You know, there's there's only one there's only one person can say that. In the field we're standing in now, you could probably say there's been Aberdeen Abri Angus cattle in this field since 1860, really, and uh, and hopefully I think they will be here for a long time to come too. Um, it's, it means it means a lot to the family themselves. So hopefully I, I can keep up the work and keep the thing going for them. In 1650, centuries before Angus cattle made their debut in the New World, a man immigrated from Holland to the East Coast and started a family. Over time, the prominence of the Vanderbilt family grew, and today the registered Angus lineage is an integral part of the Vanderbilt legacy. Biltmore Estate was conceived by George Washington Vanderbilt over a hundred years ago. He came to Asheville in the late 1800s with his mother. His mother was recuperating from some sort of influenza. And the mountains of Western North Carolina were one of the places that doctors sent people in the pure mountain air to uh, recover. He fell in love with the area and decided to build a summer home. He sent his land agents down and they purchased 125,000 acres of land. Being a man of the Gilded Age, George traveled quite a bit to Europe and to the great country estates, and that's what he modeled Biltmore after. One of the most important things he did was develop a very large and diverse agricultural program. He wanted an estate that prided itself in producing all the food consumed by the family the staff, the guests, and the workers on the estate. They had beef cattle, dairy cattle, a large poultry operation, a purebred Berkshire swine operation, Southdown sheep, certainly horses and mules for work and light riding, all kinds of forage and feed crops for the livestock. In the 1930s, the farm started to specialize. All the enterprises went away except for the Jersey dairy cattle herd, which really grew and exploded to a very, very large operation that was dispersed in October of 1982. And that's when I came into the picture to replace the dairy cattle with a registered Angus operation. We purchased 29 head from two operations in Georgia. Irvington Farms that was owned by Billy King and Cripple Pine Farms that was owned by Ed Oliver. I've been around Angus cattle most of my life and I've learned to appreciate the fact that uh, we have a very, very moderate maternal breed that's easy to work with and adaptable to many, many conditions and situations. I grew up in New York and um, when I was a student, such world famous bulls like Penn State Power Play and high pockets were born, and that was kind of exciting to be around uh, the ca those caliber of animals. So when I came to Biltmore, it was just natural for me to introduce Angus cattle. 
We started our field to table program when it wasn't really cool. That was over 25 years ago. We started producing meat for our own tables. And of course, Angus cattle are known throughout the world for their carcass quality. We can produce a white tablecloth product that our chefs really appreciate. The farm grew from 29 Angus cows to our current herd of 250. Those original 29 head of females are the only females that we have ever purchased. Breeding cattle is a very rewarding um, occupation. What's fun for me to see is now we have calves being born that were six and seven generations born and bred at Biltmore. And I can look back deep into our pedigrees and remember every animal, and that's very, very unique. I'm very proud of the fact that I have contributed to our mission of preserving the profitable working estate. Our brand is based on the Vanderbilt hospitality and that's what we do really, really well. And that continues through every operation on the estate. You know, I built the current program from the inception of the Angus Herd. It's continuing that tradition that George put into place years and years ago of growing our own food and serving it to our guests. Southwest of the Biltmore Estate, another family connected to Angus cattle can trace its roots back to a French soldier who came to Louisiana in 1720. Today, his Cajun descendants have found their passion within the Angus breed. So being Cajun, probably the biggest or funnest thing in Cajun is maybe just the way we talk. No matter where we go in the country or anywhere, they, they figure out you're from Louisiana. You know, we know where you're from, you're from Louisiana. 12 Star over here, we, we run about 135 head of mama cows and every October we have our bow sale and we sell about 45 bows and we care about maybe 15 to 20 heifers. I guess we have farm in the, in the, in the Roussel blood, because in the, in the early 1700s is when we have records of our family farming in Louisiana. There's nothing like Louisiana when it comes down to food and, and you know, we can go crabbing, we can go fishing. You know, where we're crabbing today, that, that was our backyard, that was our playground and growing up as kids, and still is. No! One of the interesting thing is every section of Louisiana has their own culture and I took a fiddle lesson in Lafayette just so I can learn the, the music culture of Lafayette. We have a jam group, we call ourselves the P-Town Ramblers and we just play music from all spectrums, you know, and, and, and we just like to entertain and play and it's just a way to forget about the rest of the world. We like to have a good time. On a full-time basis, what we do is we own a store called Roussel's, and it's a, it's a jewelry gift store. I just fell in love with the diamond business and, and everything that I expect of it and dealing with that customer and the emotional side of, of selling diamond rings. I believe that, I guess, God sends you with certain gifts, and, and, and when something touches your heart, you know, forget about anything else you're doing, chase it. So when we started uh, raising Angus cattle in South Louisiana, I remember going to a sale with my neighbor, an uh, all-breed production sale, bow sale, and it was quick to notice that the Angus cattle were selling faster and higher than the rest of the breeds. And then I went to a female sale with a friend, and same thing happened. Angus cattle all sold. They had demand for them. The rest of the breeds were a little sluggish, and I'm like, okay, I'm, you know, why would you raise anything out? I was snake bitten with, with Angus cattle. And then it was like, all right, I want to grow me a herd that produces 
and, and been respected in the state of Louisiana. Everything was new to me, being a first generation Angus breeder, but being in a retail business, we knew that customer service was a number one, and that was our first priority, customers and raising good cattle. And I know trends come and go, but if I get a vision in my mind of what I want, then I, I'm not one that's gonna stray off or be convinced to go a different way. I just felt like that Angus mama was just a great mama and, and the bow had a demand for it and trying to breed things that are maternal and low birth weight with a lot of growth. And, and that was sort of like our goal for the last probably 10, 12 years on that. On the rewarding side of the cattle, kids just growing up in the junior side of Angus, you know, I mean, they would say, what are y'all doing here? You know, your jewelry store owners. But we understood that if you, your kids had to take care of the animals and the responsibility to learn, you know, they're the future of everything. You want them to express ideas because it's a changing world out there. You know, since having retail stores, you have to get away from there. You can have the hardest day of work and get here in the evening and fall in love with the outside world, you know, just getting your hands dirty and ride through your cows and, and all your problems go away. Something about being next to Yanga's cattle, it's just, a, it's just some mystique about it. Northwest of the bayou, a monastery sits tucked in the hills of Arkansas. Their tradition of faith can trace its origin to European Catholic immigrants who came to build a life of devotion in the late 1880s. beings are body and soul. You know, we take care of our bodies, we take care of our souls as well. What attracted me to the Benedictines was their balance of work and prayer. We have a cycle throughout the day of where we have specific times of the day that we pray together, either privately or in community, and then there's times that we actually do various work. And the bells tell us, if you heard the bells, the bells tell us what time it is to so we know what activity is next. <laughs> we don't, a lot of us don't wear watches. <laughs> All the monks wear several hats. One of my assignments is on the farm. I've always used my hands my entire life. My father's in construction. So I'm a laborer, you know? I'm the guy that picks up the sticks and fixes the fence and feeds the cattle. And I help move them, of course. And uh, I enjoy that. Long before I got to the monastery, I was looking for land. I was going to actually have beef cattle, a commercial farm. I could never work that out exactly. And then when I came out here for a private retreat, I had no idea I was going to be joining this. And I didn't even know they had cattle when I came out here. A monastery is an obvious place that has a lot of tradition, a lot of things that carry on year to year trying to remember that unless you're constantly evolving, you kind of get left behind. So we want to move forward, but we also want to keep our traditions and our history. And one of the things that you have is you'll have a particular monk that has like the latest technology, but won't throw away a piece of wire because we might be able to tie up a piece of fence with it someday, you know? And uh, that's kind of, kind of nice because we do live a simple life. So even while we're moving forward, we want to be very good stewards of our resources. When the monks first came here in the late 19th century, the abbey had a farm for sustenance. You know, they grew their own vegetables and plants and they had hogs and they had chickens and they had cattle for their own table. In uh, 1999, the abbey uh, moved into the registered Black Angus current cattle operation we have. Uh, we have close to 300 head on the property right now and there's probably 250 of those are, are cows and we have a calving season both in the spring and in the fall. The Angus operation is very popular in this area. We're in a farming community. Everybody around us has, has farms. One of our former abbots, Michael Lensing, was instrumental in founding the Subiaco Co-op that's downtown. And uh, that keeps us connected very deeply to the entire agricultural community of the area.
it's, uh, it's interesting living with 40 men, you know. Uh, there's this rose-colored vision of the monks with their hands prayered in all day like this in silence, but that's not the reality. We're human. We have to interact with one another. We humble ourselves to what others need or what they're feeling today, being compassionate for one another. While I can be frustrated with a particular monk on a particular day for something he did, he's still gonna be down there at prayer with me at 5.30, praising God and praying for the whole church. So we have the same goal, we have the same mission. That's what makes us grow together and bond to one another. I think that interaction is what makes us holy. God works in mysterious ways. I ended up being in the cattle business without even trying to be in it. I believe that by producing the best quality cattle, we put better meat out there for people to eat. I know that the beef industry is gonna to contribute to feeding the world. To the west in the Rockies, a family traces its origins to a young Greek immigrant who came to Colorado to raise sheep in 1912. You know, the immigrants, when they came, most of them didn't have much when they came, so they had a very good work ethic, a strong sense of family, and just the, the desire to do well. Most of my family and most of the people in this area actually are from the northern, from the mountainous part of Greece. So they naturally just gravitated when they came to an area that looked kind of like home. My mother's first husband started here. It was all sheep. They run two to 3,000 sheep. He died in 1948. My mother went back in 1950 to Greece, married my father and then came over. So my dad had like 15 or 20 cows. Of course, they were all named and everything else too, but mostly from a milk cow. I got interested in the cattle. Then I got back in 1978 and we started to grow the cow herd. My yaya, my grandma, she, she was like a, a fierce negotiator and, a, uh, and like I said, had a lot of drive and tough. And my papu was more of a philosopher and a thinker and uh, like I said, he's a real well-educated man. I can see it in my dad and I saw it in his parents about just the, the pride that they take in their work. And you kind of see that through the Greek culture as well. It's just everybody's really prideful on their work and prideful of what they are as a family and keeping that tight-knit family and keeping the tradition alive and you know, and, and that's, you know, cooking lambs on the spit, and that's, you know, going to church, and that's, it's all those things tied into it, and, and it's the ranch life, and it's, so it's, it's, it's pretty cool to see that my, my, I definitely see my father trying to carry on those traditions as well, and, and on the business side too, you know, I see, you know, how my, my grandmother and how they ran their business, I can see that in my father, and he's, you know, he's a, she's a really good businessman, and he's passed that down to me and George as well. My wife was a second generation. Her parents were first generation, and she was second generation, but also came from immigrant parents. She always said, if you want, if you want your children to do well and to be following your footsteps, you know, to take over your business, you have to take them with you at an early age. And then when you take them with them, you don't, you don't always make it miserable for them. Like I said, the business is not, it's not always a fun business. You have to put up with heat and dust. It's dusty and there's droughts and bad storms. And then freezing cold and wind and snow. And You're out there riding in the dust and wind all day or it snows on you and you don't have a coat. Bad calving season, bad labor. You get thrown down off a horse and it hurts. Bad market. You brought the wrong boots. If you transmit that to your kids, that it's a miserable life, they're not gonna come back. But like the accomplishment of uh, like, just like Brandon today or, you know, getting the cattle work is just like, it's one of those feelings that you can't replace. And that's what we got as a young kid too, from going with our dad or our mom or whatever, be all the time putting out salt, and rounding up cows or, you know, so it just kind of, it kind of gets in your blood and it kind of just stays there, you know? So we're lucky enough to be here and at this point to grow into another generation. This is my mom's best friend, my papu, my mom's dad. I think that's, I think that's Angelo right there, and that's my mom with her smile. 
to show off her how vibrant she was in and in with my pop food too. When my father really started to, to grow this operation, he had a vision that, that nobody else really saw. He had a vision of cattle and artificial insemination and kind of where the industry would go, you know, and we started that way back then. He's always had a really, you know, mechanical mind and he likes to put stuff on paper and he can think it out and he's really good at designing things and, and you know, that goes from houses to corrals to just pretty much everything. The thing is about a corral, you have to have a kind of no cow psychology to build a good one. But you, when you run as many cattle as we do, you've got to work efficiently. Cattle usually like to go in a circle or they like to go back to where they came from. So we try to look at the pasture and try to figure out how they like to, if they like to go uphill or downhill or where they like to congregate in certain corners. And so now I've kind of stepped into that too as, as far as I, I like to draw and I like to design stuff too, kind of like he does. And so, and it's pretty impressive when you sit back and you look at all the corrals and all the systems and you see, you know, the, and how they just keep growing, you know, we kind of never stop. And that's kind of our motto is always forward. Always striving to be better. I mean, I think that's a trait from my yaya or, you know, even the ancestors came in over from Greece, always striving for something better. And that's what he was doing in the cow side of it. You know, me and George, are, are, we're millennials. We're born in a different generation, obviously. And so we have different, you know, things and different images that we want this place to go and places we want this, you know, business to grow. And, and that doesn't absolutely line up exactly with, you know, what our father or what our grandfathers have done. And me, being 65 year old, years old, and turning over a lot of this stuff to my children, I've had a little problem in transition sometimes, but I'm adjusting. It's hard to turn over. I, I remember my dad thought I was completely crazy when we, we started buying lots of cattle. But he just transitioned and he had to kind of adjust to some of the things that I was doing. At the same time, we have that in our genes and our blood, just like they did. They, we have the business sense like they did, but now it's up to us to change it so we don't go out of business. You know, leading by example is a, another huge principle. I mean, you're raising a family or children. Like I said, I don't know what I'd do if I didn't have, I mean, usually you just sell out. What are you gonna do, you get old? You can't do it. You can only do it so long. More of the wealthier people, they never return back to the really the family, the actual people that work, that own it and work it. With time, there's gonna be a little more, less and less people like that. But no, I'm real fortunate that my children have taken over, have taken over those roles. But like I said, the important thing is to lead by example, and I hope I've been a good example. West further still, in the dry mountains of Nevada, a man came to the United States with a dream in 1978 from Mexico. He didn't know that when he arrived, his future would be forever impacted by Angus cattle. I live in my country in 78. You know, I was young, I was just from 16 years old. We came to this country and we come and work here. And I used to live in this bone house. That's where I lived the first time I came and it's kind of old, but nobody's living in there now, so. Tell me your guy's house. Which, which house? Oh, this house right here. Yeah, well, that's, that was the boss house. This, this, this is just the main house where the boss used to live. I never thought I was going to live in the house. <laughs> it was a different table, but, uh, you know, we used to go in there. And the boss used to sit over here. The employees, we used to go over there. 
And, uh, you know, drawing a corner was my, my place, I guess. I don't think that he gives himself enough credit coming from where he did. It, you know, my dad came from a family of 14 kids and although he came over here to work when he was very young, he started working over there when he was very young. He stopped going to school to work and help the family and you know, my aunts always talk about how they remember him um, taking them all to the kitchen and helping my grandma feed them. This is the kitchen in the house that he grew up in in Mexico. It has two rooms, but at one point they only had the one room. And they grew up on a ranch uh, where there, there were no electricity, there's no plumbing, there's no water. Um, so life wasn't easy for them. And life isn't easy in Mexico, um, education-wise. My dad, I mean, he went to second, third grade, I think. And over there, it's a privilege. You have to pay to go to school. Here, I think a lot of people take advantage of the opportunities that you do have here. But um, he, he knew immediately what hard work was. And I was like 11 years old when I had to work in a field like a man, you know, and uh, that's how I grew up. It's crazy to think about how young he was when he came over here. Um, really just a kid, really 15 year old, 16 year old kid. <laughs> I mean, everybody talks about the American dream and and coming over and working here. And I think he landed here at the ranch and I guess he decided he liked it and he wanted to stay. That's when we hear the story of, he told my mom, all right, well, either you marry me or I'm going back and I'm not coming back. <laughs> you know, I admire my mother who 10 days after they got married went on this huge adventure with him to come over here, <laughs> not knowing anything or what she was getting herself into. They literally had two bowls two spoons, but they'd still have like people come over and friends come over and two people would eat at, at a time. My mom washed the dishes and two more people would eat at the time. And nobody complained, it wasn't like, people just understood. Just to put it in perspective of how, you know, how poor or, you know, where they started. And this is the same way it was when I come over here the first time, you know. And when I come over here at the ranch and start working, I find out it's, it's you know, it is different, but it's kind of the same thing, it's, it's work. What, 12, 15 hours and 18 hours a day, you know, that's, I was used to sit up at the environment. That's how I end up, you know, in this business. I'm not a real cowboy, but I think I know what to do with the cows. <laughs> it is hard work, but like I say, you know, I have no education, so I just, I have to do the hard work. He talks about not having a whole lot of education. I think he's very humble when he talks about that because life has taught him a lot. That saddle there, it's, it's a match as fast. And this is what I used to wear to Winnemucca when they have horses. I, get, you know. I took my coat back inside. I'm like, oh, I should have been. I oh, no, <laughs> no, 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 but that he does, he do, does it for his family. It's been a lot of work for him and I realize that now that I'm older. I think when we were kids, we were just that, we were kids. Everything was just the normal to us, you know. We all grew up here, uh, so it's what I know is home. Looking back, they did have some hard times raising four kids uh, on, on really one salary, of a farmhand's salary, which wasn't much. We had absolutely everything that we needed and really everything that we wanted. We were such happy kids here. We didn't need anything fancy. We loved playing out here, um, playing in the dirt. This is just right out here. He gave me every opportunity in the world to be successful. Uh, he taught us from a very young age, not, not by telling us, but by showing us that hard work was important, that education was, was important. Good old first day of school pictures. I remember going to school and feeling feeling this invisible pressure, I don't know if that's the best way to see it, but we knew, or at least I knew, that I had to do well to, to show my parents that all the hard work that they've done is, has been worth it. Proms, this is a honor society. The two daughters, they graduated in the first place, so really proud of these girls. This was my graduation, my high school graduation. That's when she got a scholarship. When we got to the college age, 
you know, we, we were all pretty good about trying to get scholarships and, and things, and we did, but they were always there. You, you come to me first, don't go get student loans, we'll worry about that, you come to me and we'll, we'll worry about it later, and they wanted something better for us. Uh, it was probably at the end of 87 or, or 88 when, uh, when uh, my boss decided that, uh, you know, he want to go back to California. And uh, I've been over here, you know, a long time, so I kind of know the, the job. So he told me if I, you know, just manage it for him. And I said, well, we can try it, see if I make it. I never managed anything before. One time I mentioned to him that I like to have cows. He kind of told me how we can do it, and uh, that's how I started. So when he was ready to not lease the place, I have like about 300 cows. Little by little, letting him take over, buying a few cows here, taking over the lease, slowly buying the equipment, and then until it became him himself, this was his business. We were a little scared. We were like, that's a lot of work, and <laughs> just for one guy. I usually, I was kind of scared of first when I started, you know. Um, I used to spend that much money, and I don't know if I'm going to be able to pay it, but uh, one day I thought, well, I just do it. If I come out all right, good. If you don't, well, I do something different. So. But it, it is like when I buy the place, I start buying it, I didn't feel no different. When he was ma just a worker and managing and then became the owner and the boss, there wasn't change because he just still was doing what he loved to do. Maybe somebody else, they start buying a place like I'm doing, and they probably don't want to work. I don't want to do that. I like to work if I can. He doesn't really think he's done much. He's just done his best. That's, that's how, you know, we started. And uh, I guess after the years, I don't know what happened, but I'm still here, so. Whatever I, you know, I am now, it's just uh, my wife supported me all these years. That, that's kind of a big thing for me. And uh, my kids, they did good, so that was the other part of it. So I feel really good, you know, really proud of the family that I have. So I don't say I had the, per the perfect family, but, you know, I, I'm really proud of my family. I can say that. <laughs> this, this truly is home. Now with my daughter, it's the place that I want her to, to know. You know, to, to, it's always uh, Grandpa's Ranch, you know. <laughs> That's home. They came here for that American dream and to provide for their family in Mexico and their family now and, and give us a better life than, than they had and they have. They've given us an amazing life. Northeast of Nevada, in the rolling plains, the Lakota people have become as intertwined with Angus cattle as they were with the buffalo before them. The Lakota people have been tied to this land, and I definitely feel that tie and that connection with not only my family and the animals that exist here now, but with the plants and the animals and the people that have existed here for centuries. I feel a connection with the traditional sustainability that the Lakota people used to embody in their lifestyle. The Lakota Nation was a great nation which realized all that this land had to offer from the plants which provided medicine and food for us and ways to practice our ceremonies to the animals which it was a home for like the buffalo and the eagle, and now the cattle, which we are fortunate to raise on my reservation. In the Northern Great Plains where we live, one thing that we have a lot of is grass. This land was really designed for a large cloven hoof animal. Traditionally, there were nomadic Native American tribes which followed the buffalo herd from up into Montana, down into Kansas, all the way as far east as Minnesota, and then all across South Dakota, North Dakota, and even into Wyoming. 
So there were roaming herds of cloven hoof animals on this land long before myself or my dad or my grandpa were here. Sometimes the similarities of managing a cattle herd and the roaming bison herds are lost, but we really try to capture that in how we manage our pastures, how we manage our grass, and how we let the cattle graze. We try to keep them in a herd as much as possible and reinstill that herd instinct so that they can impact the ecosystem the way it was designed to be impacted. Um, and then we also monitor our pasture utilization so that the cattle mimic the moving buffalo herd and certain lands are given rest and certain are given pressure at the right times depending on the plant community. Our cattle herd is really selected for calving ease and we really look for a good solid disposition in our cows. My dad has really allowed me to take part in the management decisions that him and his brother have made about our cattle herd and I think it really has allowed me to grow as a horseman, as a cattleman, uh, and as a young lady that is confident in being able to go out and do whatever it is that my passion drives me to doing. For me, being a fourth generation rancher is getting to know the first and second and third and fourth generation that's been here just by knowing the land. Whenever I feel lonesome from my grandpa, I can just ride across the prairie and it's like he's right there with me. My grandfather's pride and joy that he left behind was in our horse herd. He also bred our horses for disposition first. That really has been a highlight to ranching in South Dakota is getting to utilize that horse herd that he left behind as part of his legacy. One of the most prominent lessons that stands out from my grandfather was that, you know, family first. Uh, and our family isn't just those that we're related to, uh, it's everybody. And our Lakota culture teaches us that, you know, really everything is connected from the inanimate objects like the rock and the soil to the animals that we get to raise to utilize those resources to us. And our job as ranchers in the Great Plains is to not mess that up. The Lakota tradition is really to care for everybody. That originally may have been foraging for foods and sharing your bounty with those that are less fortunate. For us now, we get to bring people together over our beef. Our management influences everything that is involved in this circle of life. It really does hold true to the cultural aspect of us raising our cattle here. We live on the Cheyenne River Sioux Indian Reservation, which is one of many food deserts across Indian country. We have thousands of people that have to drive over an hour to get to any form of fresh produce or a grocery store or even a convenience store in some locations. The quality of Angus beef can help to fill the gaps that are currently still existing in our food system and that's why I feel my job is so important. Being a cattle producer, it's knowing that 30 miles away there are kids that face hunger, there are kids that face not having a meal on their plate tonight. I believe that the current barriers which exist that have prevented economic development on the Cheyenne River Sioux Indian Reservation can be broken down through enhancing our agricultural industry. And I think it is incredibly important to get our youth engaged in that agricultural industry to show them that the wide open spaces out here aren't just the middle of nowhere. There's grass growing there and that grass can be utilized and it can raise some of the best beef in the country and there's room for a career there. And I really hope that we can help to foster and inspire young individuals to go out and to pursue that career path. I've learned over the years that this land has a really cool story to tell us. From riding up onto the top of Scatter Butte and seeing where my grandpa used to ride as a young, young child, to find his cattle herd over a vast 50 mile area with no fences, you know, to down by the river where our tribal community used to be before Lake Oahe was dammed. To me, there's a really, really unique story that can be told on this land, and right now we're able to tell that with beef. Although this line of cattle has crossed the ocean, spread west throughout the United States, and expanded around the world, Back in Scotland, where the breed first began, the original line was almost lost, but a family long rooted in the county of Angus itself fought to preserve its legacy. 
I think a lot of people have forgotten that the Angus cattle are named after the actual county and we live in the centre of this county. I'm a native of Angus, as these cattle are. And when we started, there was less than 150 native Angus breeding females left in the world. A few years later, they would have been gone and you can never get them back. It was a testimony to our forebearers. They made these cattle and brought the world teeming here. The founding father of the Angus breed is recognised as Hugh Watson of Keeler Farm. They began to diligently record the breeding patterns of the cattle. Initially, they would be handwritten in big ledgers. By the mid-1800s, they compiled the hair book. And thereafter, every year, a hair book was published with any registered animals bought in that year. The cow families that are now well known around the world. Eight of them started here in the county of Angus. Behind us here are the glens of Angus. This is the range of the hills, the foothills of the Grampians. Some very austere countryside, but that's where a lot of these Angus cattle originated. In Scotland we have over 11,000 tartans and they're usually affiliated with family names. So we came up with the idea that we would create the Dunluise tartan. We made it more about the county of Angus. So we have white to represent the snow-covered Grampian Mountains and it runs down to the blue of the North Sea. On the sides of the hills we have the purple coloured heather. We then have lush green grass and it is famous for the soft fruit growing, so things like strawberries, raspberries. So we have this, what I'm calling a raspberry colour. This farm would be put together the same time as the first Herdwick principally. It constitutes 135 acres, fairly small fields divided by stone fences or stone walls which have been there for 200 years. These stone buildings with blue slate roofs, they come from the time of horses and carts and a multitude of staff with wheelbarrows. Because our farm is not large, we have no four-wheelers, no horses, we handle our cattle on foot. And we have the Dunluise herd. That's my husband, Geordie, and myself. And we have two children, Duncan and Louise. Hence the name Dunluise for our prefix, for our herd name. There are only chiefs in this family. And so we have this rule where inside the garden walls, I'm in charge. And outside the garden walls, Geordie is in charge. How would I describe Geordie? Okay, I have a, a phrase that um, we're all going to be a long time dead. And so while we're here, everybody should be passionate about somebody and about something. We bought this farm in 1990, and after a few years of commercial cattle, we decided that we were going to breed Pedigree Aberdeen Angus. And when he went to sales and looked at the current Angus cattle, he started to hunt for the shorter leg, deeper bodied, uh, triangular faced cattle that he remembered from his youth. And that led on to specialising in the original native genetics. It didn't start out as a, a, a mission, but it very quickly became that. I'm a native of Angus, as these cattle are, and when we started this, there was less than 150 native Angus breeding females left in the world. 
So it was on their critically endangered list, which is the you know, highest category of all. A few years later, they would have been gone and you can never get them back. We set out to collect the remaining cow families that were left in existence. In some cases, there were only two left. So we had to start with what was there. We knew fairly quickly that we had the potential of quite a unique product. And it was just at really at the start of families getting home computers. Could we somehow use this computer that had arrived in a TNT box and I'd assembled and with a, on a wing and a prayer? That there were no corner shops that you could walk into and get someone to write a website for you. And um, I actually just did an A4 page and that was the way we let everybody know what a great product that Geordie had. It was very much walking into the wind. Other people saw it in the early stages as a little bit of a joke. The perception, the genetics, there were a few holes in the road, there is no question. But as time went on, people then came back. Once they'd used these animals, they could see the virtues that they had. The momentum was sort of underway and it just kept increasing. Wouldn't it be neat, as he put it, to have a native Angus sale in the middle of the county of Angus, where it all began, and we've had plenty of time to think and plan. But of course, it's not usual in this country to do on-farm sales. In fact, it's unheard of. I wanted to do it on-farm, and believe you me, there have been several times I wondered the wisdom of that. I'm also a native of this county. I was born here, in this county, and I wanted to do this back here and say we overlook these magnificent hills and uh, it was important to me. So it meant starting from scratch, building a sail ring, building a rostrum, um, bringing in the tiered standing. Every single detail he has picked through. It seemed to catch the imagination of friends and family from the very beginning. And because of the network we have here, it's all people we know that pitched in to make this day. Come on, help you out. Two thousand I'm just so pleased that the day went well for him. You stick your head above the parapet, you're doing something a little different. There was an awful lot going on that day. It was so heartening to see people from different parts of the world come across, hold out their hand and address you by your name. And you think, hey, we're just a wee farm in the county of Angus. I'm not sure what um, path my life would have taken had Geordie not started to collect up these native Angus. It has been a truly, truly magnificent journey. It really has. I, I find it just absolutely amazing the people that come and have embraced what we are doing and the ethos of what we are doing, which is exactly what our forebearers did many years ago. And of course now these cattle, these native cattle, are scattered all around the world, so they are no longer endangered. From the hills of Angus to northern Scottish castles, to the Great Plains of the United States and everywhere in between, the line of registered Angus cattle is woven with those who came before. Our forebearers, both man and cattle, have established a legacy that will live on for generations to come.